chapter 10 of The Path of the Just, the book with uh, great wisdom from Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lezato, the Ramchal. We are in chapter 10, the trait of Nechius, Nechius, cleanliness. The trait of Nechius, which is cleanliness. The essence of the trait of Nechius is the person being completely cleansed of any bad trait and of any sin whatsoever. It is not enough to be cleansed of this in, in matters whose sin is widely known and obvious. Rather, one must be cleansed of this also in which the heart is persuaded into rationalizing as permissible, something which, if he would investigate it truthfully, he would discover that the, per, that the permit seemed reasonable to him only because, to permit it only seemed reasonable because the heart is still somewhat affected by the improper desire for physical gratification. Because his heart has not been purged of that desire entirely, and that is why his desire draws him to be uh, lenient for himself in that manner. We would call this also, uh, you know, more modern age would talk about this as being a level of holiness, right? Uh, just of righteousness. But cleanliness, uh, we've heard the term cleanliness is, uh, how's this? See, next to godliness. And um, we understand that this, this type of cleanliness is a cleanliness that goes beyond not doing the sin and doing mitzvah. It's the cleanliness in which your intent, your, your, um, your intention is even pure. Um, no one can really judge the intention of a person's heart, only a shem can. Therefore, a righteous person seeks to cleanse even the thoughts and motives behind what we do. So the, 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 the idea of nekius, this cleanliness, is that it goes beyond the skin surface. It goes down to the deep spiritual level. Of, and when a righteous person practices watchfulness and zeal, that watchfulness and zeal, this trait of purity and cleanliness is really important. Because at this level comes the finest level of refinement. Uh, when they make, um, for example, uh, when they distill a property, you can drink water that's not been distilled and it'd still be very good for you and healthy. Water that's been properly distilled has no impurities in it at all. You're drinking just the essence of the water that is been brought up and then cooled off again. So in reality, this, this nikius is sort of like a distillization process. Did I say that right? Distillization process of the, the human mind, the neshama, right? The soul. One who has attained nikius, however, perceives things objectively. But the person who is completely purged of his affliction of improper physical desire and is cleansed of every negative trace that such desire leaves in its wake, his perception will be completely clear, and his discernment of right and wrong will be pure, and his desire for something improper uh, will not incline him toward yielding to any matter. Rather, anything that is sin, even if it's the least the smallest of sin, his perception and discernment will recognize it as evil and will distance himself from it. This idea of having a hypersensitivity to negativity or sin. And it's not just to the obvious sin. I mean, it's obvious to any person who has any level of righteousness what is sin, right? If someone came up to you like, a, like the whole picture of the devil with the pitchfork and pointy tail, and he comes to you and says, hey, let's go out and smoke crack together, you think, this, you're nut. Don't do that. That's wrong. At the same time, we also allow impurities to come into our mind and into our spirit by our thoughts, by what we watch on TV, what we read in magazines, what we do on, in books, and we have to be sensitive to that. It's, it's like the thing that I've heard many of you mention about the Internet. You, know, you get a Facebook message and it says, hey, watch this, and it's a horrible beheading or something very terrible. It's like, why do, why do I want to bring that in? That is the type of careful purification process that a person wants to go, to, go toward. 
and they don't try to justify it in any way. They just say, this is wrong. I just shouldn't, this is something I shouldn't partake in. Uh, this is also known within the Orthodox Jewish community as, as modesty at its highest level. The Orthodox Jewish community, it is, you would not find in the Orthodox community, especially the very firm community, them reading material that is in any way not modest. Now, if you were to read that material, you go, I don't get it. I don't, what's not modest about this material? It's just the very fact that it assaults the purity of our neshama, then it's immodest. I don't know if I can find a better way to explain that. It would be like um, foul language. Though you and I hear it every day on the street, we can elevate our neshama to the place and, and purify this distilling process that goes on in our, our souls that that affects us. And I don't think we realize that sometimes we, when you work out in the world and you're around it all the time, it's hard for us to really recognize it because we get desensitized to it. But once you draw yourself away from it, and especially in, in the very firm community where they're not around any of that, and especially if the father is in yeshiva and the two eldest sons are in yeshiva, you know, the mother is, is taking care of the children. They're never around any of that stuff. And so all of a sudden when they're exposed to maybe a newspaper on the street that has something that's immodest, the average person would go, that, that, that's not immodest. But when you've reached a level of nechius, you realize this is not clean. I shouldn't partake in it. The Gemara uses the term nechius in a similar way. This is the very language of the sages used for describing those spiritually perfect individuals who purify their deeds to a great degree of purification, so that they are free from even a trace of anything negative. The Nikiyim, the Nikiyim, I'm sorry, of mind that are were in Jerusalem. Although Nikius, like Zerius, involves ridding oneself of wrongdoing, a Nahi, one who has attained Nikius takes this to a higher level. You can see how the difference between Zahir, uh, discussed in earlier chapters 2 through 5, and the Naki, even though the traits they embody are conceptually similar to each other, that Zahir is the one who is careful in his deeds and sees to it that he does not sin, that in which he is already known to him and his common knowledge uh, common knowledge that is a sin. So let's put this to sort of in a practical matter. You're in the medical field. You can, you'll, this can, you'll understand the concept here. When you have something that has been, been made sterile, sterile, it's pure at the highest level. There's no bacteria, no foreign matter on it. Uh, the way that that product remains sterile is by keeping it protected from the elements. As soon as it's opened up, you have to consider it not sterile. So if you saw an instrument lying around and, you, and someone's going to say, hand me that instrument, and you don't know the process in which that was handled from the autoclave to, to your hand, it's probably not going to be sterile, therefore it shouldn't be used. That's the thing. So to understand that this level of righteousness, the sages are talking about one not only purifies himself or becomes sterile, you understand, in the eyes of Hashem, he becomes pure at the highest level. He also maintains a protective order in his life to keep from becoming, becoming contaminated. So this is what the sages are talking about, an individual who at the highest level examines every element of their life. And the best way is this whole concept of distillation or distilling something. What does it take to distill something? Uh, exposing it to long periods of time to UV light, Right, that halt, that distill or that cleanses or kills bacteria, germs, or you boil it in water. It takes heat and water. What purifies us is the waters of a mikvah, right? What purifies us is the heat of difficulties and tribulations. We talked about uh, Abraham Avinu, who had to go through tests. Now he didn't go through these tests because he was making mistakes. He went through tests because Hashem was bringing him to higher levels. So if we approach Hashem and say, we want, I want to be purified before you, 
then you can expect certain tests to help purify you. That's, that's all it is. At the same time, there is this concept that the Torah is the living water. It's like water that flows from the throne of heaven. So that water of Torah is also something else that purifies us. We also see that the light of Hashem is, emanates from the throne of God. And that light of Hashem also brings purification. So what is the secret to this distillation process for uh, the righteous? One draws nearer to Hashem through the Torah. One draws nearer to Hashem through study and prayer. And that purifies the individual. But that person, even though they have drawn near, must watch to not contaminate themselves to be careful not to contaminate themselves. However, he is not yet a master over himself to, it, to this extent, that his heart will not be drawn by natural desire, so that such desire might not incline his heart to rationalize and to show him uh, uh, dubious permits. In various matters, matters whose evil nature is not commonly known, and this rationalization comes about because even though he tries to sincerely uh, tries sincerely to overcome his evil inclination and to suppress his desires for prohibited things, he will not, as a result of such suppression, change his essential nature. So the question is this: Can you delete your yatsa yatsa Can it be just done away with? Can you change your nature? No, it's always going to be there. Okay. So the natural inclination to contaminate is always going to be there. And we understand, you know, America compared to what it was 100 years ago. Uh, if you go to some foreign countries, you'll understand what I'm talking about is we, we are like germaphobes here, right? We don't like odor. We always like to smell pretty. We have hand sanitizers everywhere. Now you can go not just in hospitals, but you can go to stores and Walmart and see hand sanitizer things all over the place. Whether it works or not, I don't know. But the idea is that, we're, you know, that we are very conscientious of germs. Why are we conscientious of germs? Because we know that the environment is filled full of bacteria and pathogens. It's filled full of them. Are we ever going to rid the world of pathogens? No. And at the same time, it's not God's intent, because can you imagine what would happen if we didn't have bacteria in the world? What would happen if we didn't have bacteria? We'd die. What would happen if we didn't have, uh, what do you call it, uh, mold? Is it, is it not mold? There's another one now. Say again? Mildew, like mildew and mold and stuff like that and bacteria. What, what's the purpose of all of these things? And that is to eat decayed property, correct? Can you imagine all of the dead animals that would be piling up on the streets if we didn't have the capability or have bacteria to eat that stuff down? So there's a good, there's a good benefit to the contamination that is here. And the good benefit, now here we go, let's analyze this. What is the good benefit to knowing that we have a Yetzirah that's not going to change? It keeps, it keeps us in check. So why is it good to know there are pathogens? It's not to go around and become... Uh, uh, paranoid, what, what do they call the germaphobe, you know, to the highest level. I'm kind of like that, but I know some people that are like to a pathological level. I mean, it's good to know that it's there and you understand the principles. Okay, when I touch something that's been contaminated, I wash my hands. I take care of those things. So the same applies to this idea of Nikius. We we know there's contamination. We know that our inclination is to always draw us that way. But a person who has really developed Nikius, so the, the traits of cleanliness, remains clean, not because they don't have the capability of becoming contaminated. A, a righteous person, until we die and attach ourselves back to heaven, we're going to have the ability to fall backwards. So he says, he will not, as a result, such suppression change his essential nature. And therefore, he will not be able to remove from his heart the physical desire itself, but only to overcome it in particular instance and follow the dictates of, the, of wisdom rather than the demands of the desire. However, in any, 
event, even when the when desire is overcome by the dictates of wisdom, the darkness of physicality does not does it work does its work of trying to incite him and entice him to rationalize and commit subtle sins. The Ramchal goes on to explain how this changes as one progresses from Zerius to Zerizus to Nichius. However, after a person habitates himself greatly in the traits of Zerius, Zerius, Zer, Zerius, I'm sorry, it's always a tongue tire for me, to the point that he has achieved the first stage of cleansing himself, namely from this well known sin, and he uh, habituates himself to the divine service and the Zerizus require for it. And as a result of this, the love for his creator and a craving to be close to him will intensify within him. The power of this habit, uh, habituation will distance him from, the, from matters of physicality and make his intellect cleave to spiritual perfection. This process will continue until he will ultimately be able to attain the state of complete cleansing from any improper desire or uh, of sin, in which the fire of the bodily desire will be extinguished from his heart through the craving of the divine that is intensified within it. When, uh, when I was in the army, uh, it's amazing how dirty you can get and get used to it. Right? Yeah, I think the longest period was 28 or 38 days, I forgot without showering or bathing, right, during, during the Gulf War. And that's something you, you wouldn't do normally. And uh, we all, I'm sure, smelled horrible, every one of us, but we were all in the same boat. So none of us smelled to each other, right? But I can promise you that if we'd all walked into the mall in that condition, you would have smelled us from yards away. And you just, it, you know, it's amazing how you can find yourself in a comfortable place in filthiness. The opposite is the case. When you live a sterile life, you, even though you know it won't damage you right away, you just don't want to, you don't want to be contaminated by all that. Why, why would I want to walk barefooted in a place that I know when I come back in the house, my feet are going to be all filthy? Or why would I want to go to a place that I know that something is in the air where sick people like hospitals? I don't know how people work in hospitals, honestly. If I ever get sick, I don't want to go to the hospital. I want to go to the house and lay down, not in the hospital. There's too many germs in the hospital, right? So the idea is a person, when, when we struggle to keep ourselves at the highest level of purity, it becomes easier. It's not harder. It becomes easier. And the more that you live in this spiritually sterile environment, the easier it is to know what is unclean and what is impure. Though you have that propensity and maybe even the desire to be in a situation that would bring impurity, you have that there. You have the power to overcome it much easier. It's much easier to go, mm, don't think I want that. Because you have walked and lived in this level of cleanliness, and a person who doesn't walk in that level of cleanliness, even if it's at just a little bit lower level, they get used to that. I, I heard somebody recently say that uh, they grew up in a household where everybody screamed at everybody all the time. Like, ah, that they didn't, you know, it was like, come, come get breakfast. It wasn't like everything was screaming. And this person said it's very difficult to change that in my own home with my family. Because that's just how we've always handled I mean, we've always screamed at each other. It's a family language, and it's very difficult. And the problem is, 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 is this. If the children had adapted to that, that would be great. But the problem is the children are not adapting to that. They, they're hurt by it. It's damaging to them. And that's why the parents decide we've got to do something. Right? We don't want our children to think that we're mad at them all the time. We don't want them to think we're angry. We're not. This is just how we handle things. You don't tell them, 
hey, can you do me a favor and take care of this? No, it's like, get out of that, pick that up, and get out of that. Right? That's how it's dealt with. And it's easy to fall into these traps, but once again, it is what you get used to. And I believe that the highest level of cleanliness is when a person does, lives at such a level that anything less than that is unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. And though it'd be easy to fall back into it, it's just something you don't want to do. So, We, uh, we stopped off um, intensified within, right? And this is the perception. Uh, in this, his perception will remain unclouded, pure, and clear, as, as the Ramchal wrote above in the beginning of this chapter, so that he will not be enticed. He will remain beyond the reach of the darkness of his physicality, and he will be entirely cleansed from any trace of sin in whatsoever he does. We understand that this is not about sinning. This is about even avoiding the appearance of sin. I mean, this is like far beyond because the person who has this level of cleanliness is not worried about whether he's going to sin. It's that he, don't, he doesn't want to contaminate himself that would put him in a position to be a sinner. If that makes sense. The Ramchal explains that, uh, that it has or was the perfection of the trait of David Hamelech, who spoke in Psalms. Behold, it is regarding his perfection of this trait that David Hamelech rejoiced in his attainment and said in Psalm 26, 6, I wash my hands in purity and circle around your altar, Hashem. For in truth, only one who is completely cleansed from any trace of transgression and iniquity is the one who is suited to see the presence of the king and to stand in His presence. For without this cleansing, one must only uh, uh, be only ashamed and embarrassed before Him, like the idea contained in the statement Ezra HaSufer made when confessing the sins of Israel. My God, I am embarrassed and ashamed to lift my face to You, my God. We remember the text or the prophet who says, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. Now this was a Zadik, right? Although essential, essential nikius is not easily required, how certainty, certainly it is a great undertaking for a person to achieve perfection in this trait. For the, rec for the recognized and well-known sins are relatively easy for a person to avoid. We all can avoid the obvious stuff, right? Since their, imp their improper, impropriety is obvious, but the scrupulous required, scrupulousness required for attaining Nikki use is more difficult to challenge because the heart's uh, rationalization hides the subtle sin as it is written above. Now, how does the heart rationalize? Let's think about this for a moment. I can tell you how my heart rationalizes. I can't tell you how your heart rationalizes. My heart rationalizes by saying... Um, well, culturally, it's all right. I mean, everybody does it this way, right? I mean, it's not necessarily a sin. It's just everybody does this way. And it's the Torah doesn't prohibit us from doing this. Everybody else does it. No one's going to get hurt. It was just a joke, right? I'm a jokester. I say funny things. I don't mean to hurt anybody. I made people laugh. But have I dumbed my spirit down by doing certain things that was not at the highest level of purity? That's the question. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. You see, this, the, the reason why that we're studying this book is not to gain knowledge. The reason why we're studying this book is to put ourselves on the path of righteousness. And the only way to obtain righteousness is to hear from the voice of the great sages who understood what righteousness was and what it was required. And as we know, this trait is the most difficult. But none of these traits are too difficult for a person to obtain. It, you can do it. It just takes hard focus and work. In the same way that it takes a tremendous amount of attention to detail 
to, uh, to cleanse and to purify a product, for example, a surgical uh, product, or to purify water. The same goes in the fact that if we want to live righteous lives, it's, re it's incumbent on us to at least attempt to work at that highest level. Two Talmudic sources demonstrate that, of, demonstrate that avoiding subtle wrongdoing is a daunting task. And this is similar to what, uh, with, uh, to what, to that which the sages of blessed memory said, the sins that a person tramples on with his heels surround him at the time of judgment. And in the same vein of blessed memory, we see in, uh, it says, most people stumble in matters of theft, a, my, uh, a minority of them, in illicit relationship, and all of them in the dust of evil speech. Because due to this exceedingly subtle nature, all people stumble in the dust of evil speech, to the extent they do not recognize such speech as sin. Now, let's look at this. I like to use metaphor and analogies, so excuse me if this is, I'm being redundant in this matter, but this, this paints the best picture. We all know that you would never take uh, an item that would be used for treating a wound and allow it to be in the bathroom, right? It's just pretty obvious. You wouldn't leave those things in the bathroom because they become contaminated. That's pretty obvious, so we wouldn't do it. And we'd, we'd know it would be obvious you don't use an old bandage that has been on a wound to bandage another wound. That's pretty obvious too. Though it's possible, and we know in some cultures, the reason why they have Ebola and where they're at is because they were, they were bathing corpses. That's why that Ebola spread, because it's a tradition that they bathe the corpses of their family members. And so it wouldn't be just one person who dies of Ebola. It's the whole family, because they all participate in this ritual of bathing and this bathing is not a washing down of a special solution that a mortician has. It's soap and water like you're giving them a bath. So they're contaminating themselves. That is obvious. However, at the, at, at the lowest level, everybody does this. Everybody does evil speech. At the lowest level, everybody goes around breathing. Everyone breathes. And people who are sick come, and con uh, come into contact with other people who breathe. That's the hardest thing to protect is something that's so common. Everybody breathes. How can you keep from getting a cold or getting a viral infection if you, unless you isolate yourself completely? That's the only way, I guess, to isolate yourself. But in the same way, if we understand this, that everybody, in matters of theft, a few people do thievery. In matter of illicit relationships, yeah, there are some people that do that. But the dust, the thing that's common, that you get on your feet, everybody gets dirty with evil speech. That is the hardest thing. Because due to its exceedingly subtle nature, all people stumble in the dust of evil speech. To the extent that they do not recognize such speech as sin. Our sages speak of David and Melech's mastery of this trait, and he merited as a result. The sages of blessed memory said, that David Hamelech was vigilant and would cleanse himself entirely from all these subtle sins that most people trample underfoot. And therefore, he would go to war against the enemies with absolute trust that he would be victorious and would ask Hashem, allow me to pursue my foes and overtake them. Do not let me return until they are destroyed. Something that Jehoshaphat, Asa, and others who or were righteous kings did not consider themselves worthy to ask because they were not so cleansed of the sins as David HaMelech. The Ramchal shows how the sages understand David HaMelech's request as indicated in the words of David HaMelech himself. And this is what he said, uh, he himself stated in the course of his words of the prayer that is in Psalm. Hashem, please recompense me According to my righteousness, repay me in a way befitting of purity of my hands. Now think about it. Rarely do we ever pray, judge me according to my righteousness. Why? Because we don't trust our righteousness, right? If anything, we're saying, Hashem, judge me according to your mercy. Not according to my righteousness. But David Amalek says, 
pay me according to me or repay me according to my righteousness because I have clean hands. That's what we all want to achieve, right? The purity of hands in which David Amalek speaks is purity and cleanliness that we have dis discussed in this chapter. And when he goes on to say further in Psalm 30, verse 30, For with you I smash a troop, and with my God I leap over walls. Allow me to pursue my foes and overtake them. Do not, do not let me uh, return until they are destroyed, which is the verse the sages cite. And David Amalek's unique request for victory, as mentioned above. Thus, we see the psalm itself as David Amalek makes his unique request in the merit of his cleanliness. That's a really high level. Did David Amalek make mistakes? Did he make a fatal error in taking on uh, an illicit relationship or a relationship that was not particularly good? Yes. Interesting that we hear that David sinned with Bathsheba, though it was not proper, was not illegal. Do you understand that? And this is how it comes down. Every soldier that went to war had to give their wife a get, right? Divorce papers. Basically meaning that if he was killed, then she could easily and quickly recover and remarry without having all the legal problems that would come with trying to prove that he was dead in battle. David Hamelik said, well, she's already technically divorced and so it wasn't appropriate but it wasn't illegal that's why David was not sentenced judgment for stoning for having taken another man's wife go ahead correct No, absolutely. Right, so... Okay, but... Yes. But if he had violated the intent of Torah as it is written, then he would have been needed to be stoned. And he wasn't. So why did he was he able to just repent? Because what he did was not a violation of the Torah, even though it was inappropriate. He had a relation. He took a man's wife. He took a man's wife, and he was underhanded in which he did it. Though technically, legally, he didn't... It wasn't at the... It was a loophole. That's the way to say it. It was a loophole. So, which, mind you, if David HaMelech could be that bold to say to Hashem, I have clean hands, judge me according to my, my righteousness yet he does this, does that leave room for us to be able to grow? He's a man. So it's, it's a good thing. It helps us to understand that even in that situation, we understand that our, that our evil inclination can look for loopholes. We can always look for a way to get around the system, to game the system. And even in our highest level of righteousness, it's easy to fall and to pray to that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, he... He broke. Absolutely. 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 The idea of, of Nikius, of cleanliness, is not that we will not, it's not that we will avoid forever being unclean. Yes, ma'am. It was it was a sin. It was he he violated he violated a, a the law of God by taking something that was not technically his, even though he had a loophole. If that makes sense. It's a weird. It's just a weird situation. We'd have to get a, a great. Situation. Maybe we'll ask Rabbi Greenbaum when he comes. It'd be a good opportunity to do that. It is. It is. It is. It is. It can be a little confusing. 
Right. Let's let's. Right. That's that's a very good point. Um, and we'll have to ask a greater mind than mind that question. However. Um, The truth is, even though he had a failure, he still was a man of cleanliness and right, 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 righteousness. Absolutely. 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 So he did. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that in mind, let's go back to our metaphor or analogy that we use. Uh, we often claim that something is a sterile environment. We'll say, you know, we keep up, we have a sterile home, we keep things clean. But you and I both know that there are constant upkeep because there are pathogens that lay dormant. There are things that hide its way around different corners. And if you're in a surgery environment, that is a sterile environment. But as soon as you open that patient up, what happens to the environment? It's contaminated. So even with all of that, you're still saying we maintain a sterile environment. So the idea is that our cleanliness, our nikios that we have, we can say that, yes, Hashem, we stand before you cleansed and clean with a pure heart, even though that I've done something I shouldn't have done, I still am maintaining my sense of cleanliness before you. That's, that's, that's what we want to understand. David Amelik also implies that, that attaining nikios is no small accomplishment. In truth, Surely this trait is difficult to acquire, for the nature of man is weak and his heart is easily swayed by alluring physicality, and he permits for himself the things for which he can find sufficient grounds to be misled into believing them permissible. Surely one who attains perfection in this trait has already reached a lofty spiritual level, for he has stood in the face of a powerful battle and prevailed. The Ramchal concludes... Now that we have explained the general outline of Nikios, we will proceed in the following chapter, which will be chapter 11, to clarify the details of this trait. Nikios refers to cleansing oneself from the subtle manifestations of bad traits and subtle traces of wrongdoing that can result from rationalization. What is, what is a, another description for subtle? What's another good word? Insignificant, how about um, culvert, disguised, hidden, not very obvious, right? Not very obvious. So the, uh, this, 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 um, this person who develops this cleanliness cleanses himself not just from the sin. I mean, the sin's obvious, but even the most subtle one. And we'll give an illustration. And I know some of you have, you've practiced this and you know what I'm talking about. Um, you realize that you've done something wrong toward another person, or you feel that you have done. Immediately, what do you do? You usually get on the phone and you go, hey, look, I really shouldn't have said that. It was inappropriate. Or maybe you said something that was funny or inappropriate, but you realize it was wrong. You call them and you tell them, they go, ah, come on. It's ridiculous. No, it's fine. I thought it was funny too. But deep down inside, you know, mm, that, that was subtle. What was driving that in the deepest part of me, that was subtle and could have, and really was not of good intent. I shouldn't have said it, right? How often do we say something slightly off-colored? It's not bad, just slightly off-colored, and we justify it. But a person who has Nick Hughes goes, mm, ah, I'm just, I'm cleansing myself of even that. And that's a, that's a hard battle. As long as one is still under the spell of desire for physical gratification, he is subtle to such rationalization. Only once he has completely freed himself from these desires will he be able to recognize and avoid the trace of sin. Therefore, if one wishes to be naki, then after attaining zerirus and zerizus, will he continue to strengthen his love of Hashem and passion for mitzvah until his desire for spirituality extinguishes the, fi desire, or the fire of his desire of earthly pleasure. This is a difficult task, but
but accomplishing it is a supreme achievement. I'll say this in closing. I find it incredibly, uh, I'm incredibly grateful to Hashem that I can spend these years that I am now at my age studying Torah and being around people who love Torah. Because I lived in the regular world. Right? I worked in the regular world. I worked around smoking, joking, cussing, foul-mouthed police officers and soldiers for my career, right? And um, I, I'm not sure how one can actually achieve that in that environment, honestly. Your husband works in the prison system. I mean, for him to maintain the level of righteousness that he is now, it's remarkable because... It is remarkable. He is a he is a pure, righteous soul. I love him, and I known I've known people that worked in the prison system, and they become no better than the criminals. I mean, really. And you, your husband probably can identify. I know people like that. Uh, same thing in law enforcement. You you work in the ghetto for so long, the officer though he looks like a law enforcement officer, he's just as ghetto in his mentality, the way he treats other people, and. I, I remember distinctly a time in my law enforcement career that I knew it was time to start breaking away and find a new way to do something different. When I found myself communicating to them like they were talking to each other. I'm talking about the bad guys. Because that's the only language they know. I could have had a, a continued having a successful career doing that. But deep down inside, I knew something was that's just not right. I, I don't talk that way at home. I don't communicate to my children that way. And I'm living a double life. I'm having a foot in both worlds. You really cannot do that. And somebody who is in that environment, wow, it's a special person that can do that, that can do that. But even a special person who's able to maintain that has to be ever vigilant that that is a contaminating environment. And it takes a special person to be able to focus in their prayer life and the focus on their actions to maintain that level of readiness and spirituality. And so for us in this environment here, of those who come to the study, it's so much more easier for us uh, to maintain that. It really is much easier. So we actually don't have an excuse compared to everybody else, do we? So that concludes the class. <laughs>